Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to those of us who are joining from earlier time zones. Welcome to the first research skills series of the UE St. Augustine Faculty of Law. We are continuing something that we started in January, but we're going with even fuller force now. And we're so grateful to have our speakers with us today for our first one for the semester. So we have Zvi Rossen, who is going to be talking about conducting archival research. And we have Paula Gabriel. Zaragoza Cardinales, I hope I pronounced that okay, who will be talking about conducting a countrywide case study. So as we usually do, we go straight into this. Um, no long introductions. We're going to go straight to the research skills. I hope you all find this very enjoyable. The session is being recorded and will be posted on our faculty's YouTube after. So if you have to leave for any reason, rest assured that you will be able to catch up online. So I'm going to hand it over to Z to start us off. All right, howdy everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as I'm actually in the Midwestern United States, I decided I would join you in spirit with a virtual background. Um, and this is sort of an interesting question to be asked to, about conducting archival research. So a lot of my, re my research might be characterized as legal history. So I'll talk a little bit about how to conduct archival research and some of the pitfalls to be aware of in doing so. I figured I would highlight some of the examples from my current project, and I would focus on those. Um, so my, I figure we'll, we'll have a Q&A after, but if you have questions during, just raise your hand using Zoom. I'd be happy to get to them at the time as well. So what is archival research? So archival research is research that involves searching for and extracting information from original archives. So archives are historical, non-current documents, records and other sources related to the activities and claims of individuals, entities, or both. They just both preserve historic material and make it available for future use. Generally speaking, in the law, you're dealing with archives that are working offices. They aren't simply um, library entities, but your mileage will vary. It's gonna be a mix of libraries and archives but also court offices and other official offices that are hanging out the documents for a number of reasons. So why would a lawyer or a law student want to do archival research? Well, there's a couple of reasons why. Um, one is legislative or administrative history. So for instance, I filed a brief with a court, um, actually two of them, in the past um, six, eight months, but relied heavily on archival research and legal history. So these are saying, you know, for contested questions of law regarding copyright law in my case, I went back to the 1800s and I showed various documentation regarding the claims at issue. A major issue is property records, determining, you know, who owns what going how far back Trying to tr trying to trace titles itself a substantial part of um, the law. And related to that is something called legal genealogy, figuring out who who owns what, et cetera, in terms of determining the, the genealogy of someone wherever the assets you're trying to figure out who owns them. And the last one is legal history for any number of reasons. For um, you might be doing it for literary history. For, so, for instance, you're trying to work on the life of an author and to you know, understand the literature better. So you look at, at for legal documents, which is a paper I'm currently working on involving Edgar Allan Poe and his bankruptcy filings. Um, you might be interested for just straight history of a law, really any number of reasons. So views of the archives sometimes are much more like the end of Raiders of a Lost Ark. You know, this endless warehouse of boxes, essentially no organization, good luck finding anything. There might be one person who knows where things are or has a rough idea, but it can be difficult to find. More often than not, that's not the case. I wish I could say it's never the case, but it's not. Um, more often, what you have is more like on the left which is it's an organized versus box numbers versus a finding aid typically available online that you can reference. You can, especially these days more than ever, the fact that finding aids are online, 
makes it enormously easy to figure out where you should be looking. Uh, I'll say in addition, the website archives grid is, effect is effectively an interactive search engine of finding aids of archival sources. So if you're looking at something, the finding it, you know, like archives grid or just Googling finding aids can be very useful for finding stuff. You know, I will say, I will I have one example a little further on that is like Raiders of a Lost Ark example. It does happen. And if you are, and if you can't get it, frankly, using archives on the left, it's going to, it's going to take you a tremendous amount of time. It doesn't mean it's not worth it, but it'll take you a tremendous amount of time. Archives can be anywhere. So I'll tell you a little story. Um, I have a sort of research project I've been doing to find transcripts of oral arguments of US Supreme Court cases. And I got in my head that, at, that ASCAP, which is one of the major rights collecting organizations in the United States for legal compositions, would have some of these transcripts in their files. I contacted ASCAP and I was told, oh, we have this whole library of manuscript materials, but we're about to throw it all out. I naturally said, oh my gosh, you know, I, what if I can arrange a donation to a law library? They said, sure, if you come soon, you can take it. I arrived there and there were probably, I was prob and I showed up for a business meeting, a suit and tie. And instead I was shown a bunch of empty banker boxes and a wall of books and they just said, take what, take what you want, just don't take that shelf. So I proceeded to box up 24 boxes of books, take them to the George Washington University Law Library and donate them. And, and what was there was amazing. There was this, I'm not sure if people are familiar with Mae West, the uh, burlesque and film star. The original record of her lawyer and her obscenity trial was in there. This is not a published book by any publisher. This is about lawyers, original trial papers bound into a book. And a really priceless find. And they were just sitting in the library of a corporate of a corporation where that lawyer had worked. And you never know where, where they might be. Don't hesitate to look, even in unorthodox places. Of course, the flip side of this is that unfortunately a lot of it can be missing. Even more than that, when you're in a library or archive, don't hesitate to dig and assume that they know what they have. So this is an example that I've used a few times, but the Library of Congress has sometimes a copyright card catalog. It's the largest card catalog in the world at 50 million cards. And you might assume that everything that's there is easy to find, but you go in the front part, which is the part that most researchers are going to be using, you know, is a front room. There's a back room of the really old stuff. In the back corner, there is this card, the card, this um, cabinet of cards, not all of which are labeled. And you can see a bunch of these cards, card catalogs, there's no labels on the shelves, a little hard to see here. When you open up this card catalog, you have an inventory of rejected articles, exactly what I was looking for. The only way I would have found this is by actually opening up the card catalog, the unlabeled catalog shelves, and looking to see if there was any um, anything there. So, I mean, a lot of work on the markets can be, can be labor intensive, can involve looking and you don't always find what you're going to expect. When I was at the um, ASCAP, for instance, I wasn't looking for People versus May West. I was looking for Supreme Court transcripts. So I didn't quite find what I was looking for, but what I found was also really helpful to my research. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some pitfalls and challenges of archival research. Um, as I mentioned, I was doing some research on um, copyright examination through history. And I found this letter to the Librarian of Congress. This is my scan from a microfilm. Micro, some of you may have used microfilm. 
I'm probably increasing numbers of you haven't. Um, there's still a lot of material on microfilm that you have to, you know, that, you know isn't has not been scanned and you have to access that way. It's a little bit of a hassle, but with use it once or twice, it's pretty doable. Librarians will know how to use it in any, any archive you go to. But this letter from a cousin, Hal, talks about a rejection of a copyright from an era when there's no systematic records. This is called a pageant, the pageant, a year. You have some descriptions of it here. You have the name of the author, um, which um, you can see it's Miss Laura, Miss Laura. Um, we can try to read it. On the first letter, the fourth full line, I believe it says Miss Laura Hills, but it could be wrong. Reading names that we'll get to can be very challenging. But Cousin Hal, I assume this was Cousin Hal, this, this was Cousin Henry, probably, probably Cousin Henry, Henry Spofford. There's only one problem with it. There's no Henry Spofford, who was a cousin of a librarian, his name was Ainsworth Spofford, um, who was around at the time, or, and certainly not at that address. I tried to figure out who it was. And I tried putting this address into a Boston city directory for 1893. Very common practice. You know, city directories are produced in most places, and you can have a very good way of tracing an address to a name or a name to an address and try to put someone in context. Even if you know a name, it can often be helpful to look in the directory, get a better sense of who they were living near, who they were living with, et cetera. There was no entry for a 323 Beacon Street in Boston, Massachusetts for 1893. No Henry Spofford at all in the Boston City Directory. What I did next was I tried entering that address into Google Books. And entering that address in Google Books gave me a little bit of a surprise. There was no Henry Spofford. There was a Harriet Spofford who spent her winters at that address in Boston and her summers in Newburysport in the country. I, would, I had always assumed that Hal, cousin Hal, is Henry. What I'm pretty sure it now says is cousin Har, H-A-R, short for Harriet Prescott, Prescott Spofford, who was a famous novelist of the era and was indeed a cousin of Ainsworth Grant Spofford, librarian of Congress. I was bringing in my assumptions as to who was writing and I need, and it didn't occur to me to look for Harriet even. So you wanna be sure you're opening your mind about who and what correspondence could be um, before you dig into it. Another challenge of archival research is that you're often only getting one side of a story. The most common form of archives are correspondence, letters people have received. Unfortunately, you're almost always getting only one side of a story. Occasionally you get incredibly lucky and there's carbon copies of a correspondence, especially for more recent, especially for 20th century. But a lot of times you don't have it. And you're really just doing the best you can. So I found this file in the correspondence of the Library of Congress. Um, this says, you know, in communication, please note we have registered other, other piano stools for copyright before. Um, you are not registering this one. Please advise what's going on. And we are applying again to push you harder. I don't have their response. What I do know is that in early 1895, they did register number 5080. Now I can surmise from some of this that they registered the photo of, 50, of 5080 I can imagine some correspondence but that was sent from the Library of Congress to Tonk Manufacturing that says we'll register a photo, but we're not going to register a stool itself as an article. I can imagine that, but I don't actually have that correspondence. And so if I'm writing this up, indeed how I did write it up, is to say what I know is, is what is in the correspondence and that a registration was made. I presume it's the same thing. 
I presume there's correspondence back. And I can see a time delay of at least six months. This is July 9th, 1894. I know the registration wasn't made until early 1895. So I can presume certain things. There was a delay, there was further correspondence back and forth. But that's all I have. I can say for sure that I don't have proof that there was a response from the Library of Congress saying anything in particular. But I have circumstantial evidence that leads me to believe certain things. And so you can draw inferences, but you don't want to make assumptions. Reading handwriting, another real challenge. Um, generally speaking, reading names is incredibly um, difficult. In the chat, does anyone want to take a guess what the, per what the name of this person is? Just curious what people think. What, what, you know, what is this person's name? Okay, I'm trying to type it out. <laughs> okay, no rush. <laughs> no rush. This one took me a, a, a while to figure out. <laughs> okay. So Timothy Afonso got the part I couldn't get. Um, I just assumed it was something like Phelps, which is a, a name I would recognize, or, or you know, or something, or, or I thought, not Phelps, but rather it was Beach, or another name. It is indeed Beach. And that took me some some time to figure out. The full name is Hunt Huntington Phelps Meach. Huntington was an 18-year-old kid who was working. Does anyone? No, the name, the name below. The, this is the name of it, and and what it is. Below the name, there's another, there's another line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, you know, Marcus Jones handwriting will definitely do that to you. Um, so Tim, so Huntington was an 18-year-old kid who wanted to register a board game map. And this is his letter after the game, after the map was rejected. So I was able to use the next line as a clue to figure out what the name was. This says care, C, this is CO, care of national. Fire Insurance Company. And once I figured that out, his father was a major figure there. He was an 18 year old who was working at his father's company. And I used it to trace back what the name was. And also in this case, once again, I only have his letter and I have a later copyright registration where the Library of Congress allowed registration of his game military tactics. But what they registered was not the board, which was a very generic checkerboard pattern, but instead the rules. I can presume I have a, a letter from a librarian saying, roughly, I will register rules, but not a board game, but I can't assume that. So I'd have to make clear that I make a logical leap there. I talked about that the archives are rarely Raiders of a Lost Ark. But there's always exceptions. What you're seeing here is often recognized as a first ever movie. This is actually a camera test from, from the lab of Thomas Edison, of Edison's assistant, Fred Ott, putting some tobacco up his nose and sneezing. Ott was apparently famous for doing this as a party trick, his exaggerated sneezing. And this film, this sneeze, like I said, one of the first recognized motion, motion picture for some, though there were a few other camera tests. 
a copyright registration was given for as a, for a, for this as the kinescopic record of a sneeze it was granted readily but we know from october of 1893 an earlier motion picture copyright was granted and it's in his word kinetoscope to mean movie we for a hundred and something years no people didn't know where this was and so for this one because you're looking for a first ever movie it's a major find a dutch researcher named cloudy Optin camp actually went into the back sort of the warehouse of a library of congress and found out what it was but it really did involve going through endless unmarked boxes that hadn't been opened since 1965. And we eventually figured out it was an effective film script of, of blacksmiths. Um, I, I was helping out, but it's hard research. Um, sometimes it happens, but you only want to do that if it's really, really big to the point where the discovery itself will be a big news. And it does also indicate a lot of libraries and archives still have unprocessed material Un unprocessed material is tempting, but it's really, it's often, gonna, it's often just going to take too long to be worthwhile, but it does exist. The last piece I have, and I figure if we have extra time, I, we can go through some of the file together, um, is a very typical litigation case file. Um, Mary Louise Fuller, AKA Loy Fuller, is one of the pioneers of modern dance. And her serpentine dance was a sensation in New York in the 1890s. She tried to get a copyright registration for her serpentine dance and then sued someone named Mary, named Mary Louise Be Bemis, who, was a, uh, who had actually replaced her. Basically, Fuller was doing this dance at a theater the owner of a theater hired Bemis. Really, Fuller won more money, so Fuller was fired, and Bemis was hired to copy, um, um, you know, Fuller's dance. Fuller sued Bemis, and the the file is really fascinating because you can, what it shows you is the last most important lesson I think of the archives: don't believe everything you read especially in legal history, what you're seeing is argument. You can give certain credence to what's said and, certain, and less credence to what's argued, but ultimately it's a lot like, you have to think about all of it like evidence. You know, when you have a document that says something, the only thing that proves conclusively is if a document says something, you still have to interrogate the document for where it comes from, why it might be saying it, reasons why it might conflict with other information, and trying to figure out from a broader context what the real, what's really going on. And don't just assume that because a document says it, it's true. So do you have any questions? I'd be happy to talk about how you can find things. We had some great comments in the chat about um, you know, some of the resor some resources there. I'd also comment for an incredible amount of material online in scanned archives, both scanned by individuals or in part of organized collections. So a lot of archival research doesn't have to mean actually going anywhere. And in particular, if you're doing US legal history, I mean, a, um, the U.S. National Archives has an absolutely terrible but rich website called catalog.archives.gov that has a tremendous amount of information where you don't have to go anywhere. And I'm happy to give a little tutorial on how to use it as well. Yeah, that's it. thank you. And I'm looking forward to some questions. Thank you so much, Lee. That was very interesting. Personally, I have not conducted archival research before. I know that it is hard to do. And from your talk, I can see the challenges. What I didn't realize, though, is that it nearly involves some detective work and forensic analysis to actually make sure you are checking any assumptions you might have about the writing with the name example you gave us, even interpreting the handwriting and putting pieces of documents together. Um, so my first question actually is, how did you get into archival research? 
You know, I wish I had some explanation that I have great training in archival research. The truth is I have a degree in history and I was doing a master's in um, um, IP at George Washington University. And I got really interested in the question of how we got a performance right for music. And I said, oh, it was created in 1897. Wonder why? And a little to my surprise, no one had ever answered that question. And I happened to say, well, I, sh I should go looking. And I ended up looking at the US National Archives, which was somewhat helpful. Although a lot of times with official archives, you realize you get official documents, which is to say documents that say something, but are often very opaque. They don't give you any color, any commentary. What I found was the real secret was the correspondence of some of the people who are behind it. And I remember on that project, I found a smoking gun, and I haven't haven't gotten what a smoking gun as good since. For I was trying to figure out the motivation of one of these congressmen, and one of these congressmen had written a letter to someone in New York saying, "These are my motivations for introducing this bill." You never find that; it's, it's never that easy. Um, but I did, and that really unlocked a lot of a project. And from there, I just I mean, the thing with the archives is that there's, they have their own logic and they have a very, um, once you start to learn how to work with them, you start to realize that A, archivists are wonderful people and want to help. And there's so much great stuff out there that, I mean, and there's sort of a joke among archivists that people say they found stuff. In reality, we always knew it was there. But what, what you're doing as a legal historian is acting as a bridge in between stuff that's in the archives and for various reasons hasn't been connected to other areas. And those other areas that you're part of, you know, law practice, legal academia, other disciplines of cross-disciplinary research. Um, and understanding both the law and archives is really a valuable skill because I'll, Truth is, practice of law hasn't changed nearly as much as you might think in 100, even 150 years. That is so interesting that literally something in your master's caught you and it's pulled you in since then. I mean, that smoking gun was amazing, though. God, that's, must be the, that's like the actual dream of somebody conducting that type of research. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, anyone who has a question, you can feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. And I'd like to point out, Posby, if you ever want to do some um, Caribbean archival research, there are the J.D. Celia records. Um, our librarian, Miss Raja, who is a fantastic librarian, by the way, has put the links in the chat. We also have the Muslim Mean Coup documents and the Wooding Fraser papers. And I've actually been um, messaging Miss Raja, during your conversation, because uh, I was thinking, wow, there must be so many documents in the region that perhaps are just sitting in people's homes, and perhaps we should do something about this. So this is something we want to look into. Um, so if anyone has a question, do let me know now. I know Z also has a faculty meeting to attend today. Uh, <laughs> Justin, you can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that presentation, V. Um, it was really interesting. And I have, I guess, Simple, but maybe technical question. So is there a big difference in writing legal archival research papers as opposed to, let's say, traditional doctrinal research papers or traditional legal analytical papers? Is there a big difference in style in terms of how it can be done or should be done? So there's two, I think this is one of those papers I want to write one day. I think there's actually two different things we both call legal history. One is much more history of the law and is writing a history paper about the law. That's not really what I do. I'm not a trained historian. What I do is I do legal history. So I'm looking at our visa archival sources as part of telling the prologue and developmental history of how we got to where we are today and how it informs, frankly, whether the people who were making decisions back then were animated by similar or different concerns and whether those concerns have changed over time, whether their concerns have been borne out or not, and what lessons it has for the future. So this paper examining copyright, for instance, it's structured a little differently. 
than a pure doctrinal paper that just looks at the idea of copyright examination and offer suggestions on how to fix it. But I think fundamentally, it's not a different animal. It's still a law review, a law review article. It's just with more of a background section than you typically expect. Um, so is you know, and that's, that's just been my approach. Not everyone wants that in law review article. I think there's definitely some people really like what I do, and some people would prefer more of a doctrinal approach. And I think what's great is there's room for everyone. Um, great, thank you. Uh, yeah, Eden. Yes, good afternoon. I know I joined a bit late, but I was able to get the gist of what um, you were conveying. I, I want to piggyback on Justin, Justin's question. What about a hybrid format? Is that possible? Uh, since you're dealing with legal history, could the two approaches to research be combined? Oh, absolutely. I think, I, frankly, I think that's, I think lawyers are always doing some history. I think that, you know, the background section, um, of almost any brief, any law review article, you're all, it's all about telling the story. And part of law is also storytelling, right? I think, um, you know, if you're litigating a case, you want to really, you know, reserve that line from the Simpsons. Um, and I know the Simpsons are increasingly outdated. There's the truth and the truth. Whereas, you know, different ways of portraying it. And yeah, all that this really involved by developing a hybrid is to expand that storytelling and to back it up and to try to neutralize it. Because you have this line sometimes that professional historians will use that there's law, something is law office history. And it's a way of writing it off. Um, and there is an element of truth to that. A lot of law review articles um, use history for support, for support instead of illumination. And I think the challenge, if you're going to do much of a hybrid piece, is to make your history more rigorous and not simply focus on supporting your position, but rather to, you know, do much more of an even-handed approach. But yeah, absolutely possible, I think. All right, so we have time for one more question. So if anyone has a question, now is the time. I would just chime in briefly. You're talking about um, possible research. There's tremendous research to be done on the history of trademark law involving the Inter-American inter Trademark Convention in particular. Um, and I know a lot of the spirits companies, um, both um, there and in the region, were tremendously involved in that. And those archives have not been mined at all, in my experience, so possibly of interest. So something for the audience to think about, avenues for research. See, I must thank you for this. It was very interesting. Whenever we have these um, seminars, I'm always amazed at how much opportunity and different avenues there are for legal research, because I think it's easy for us to all kind of feel comfortable and stick into, you know, one track that they were accustomed to. But there are so many different avenues, even within your own area. For example, for me, archival research in the right publicity sounds like something that would be super interesting to look into. It's just not something I've even considered. So I must thank you for sharing your knowledge on your expertise and your excellent detective work that you have done. So thank you very much for your presentation today. And I'm going to hand it over to Paula. And I do hope see, that you feel welcome to attend uh, future seminars that may be of interest to you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Paula, you are still on mute. There we go. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, well, hello, everyone. It's nice to meet you all. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the um, uh, methodology, data collection, and analysis of my case study which is so looking into um, a particular law called um, Marca del País, 
which is for agricultural products in Puerto Rico, which is a certification mark that has the potential of becoming a geographical indication. It started off in 2019, before the pandemic, as a really broad, I wanted to solve all of the island's issues using intellectual property and entrepreneurship as an economic development plan. And further along the way, I narrowed down to this law uh, where it, it is still using intellectual property, it is still using entrepreneurship, but more focused on agriculture and it is for economic development. So I kept the overall theme, but just narrowed it, narrowed it down. And what really helped me was that I made the decision of changing my dissertation advisor. I had a situation where he didn't, didn't really match with my goals and he wasn't really giving me useful advice. So I just decided to change him. Um, okay. Um, so first, uh, I started with reading everything I could find about Puerto Rico, because the thing with Puerto Rico that you will see later on is that if it weren't for the U.S. government, there wouldn't be anything recorded in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. Um, so I had to learn, search for law books, newspaper articles, law journals, congressional hearings, USDA census, grant reports, statistics, even social media. Like I have a good excuse on spending hours on social media because there was it was so hard to collect data. And I also did 40 interviews on the basically the most representative people on the agricultural supply chain in Puerto Rico. And I collected all the data in Sotero and Atlas um, and, and started from like major broad themes and started narrowing it down. Um, first, obviously, uh, Puerto Rico agriculture, um, case studies on like the best practices and things to avoid and the famous five factors that I had to come up with on uh, the five factors on geographical indication policies. Um, some of the limitations, as I mentioned, was the lack of information about Puerto Rico. Um, in general, Puerto Rican literature is very focused on the uh, colonial status or on the tax haven. It's not focused very rarely on agriculture, even less so the mix of agriculture and the IP. Um, and if you find anything about IP literature um, talking about Latin America or the Caribbean or the US, it often excludes Puerto Rico because we're everything and none of the above all at the same time. Um, plus on top of that, COVID and my change in dissertation advisor, but at least with COVID, I got the chance to go back home and I was closer to the people um, that I got to interview, plus uh, the University of Puerto Rico and uh, their um, uh, their library started to uh, scan and uh, put everything in digital form. So that was really helpful. Um, so that's why you see it in the major works. But also I found two dissertations that talked first about my case study law, Marca del País, and about geographical indications, but more on the perspective of international law. It was a, more broader than, than mine, I would say. So I started identifying things. First, Puerto Rican literature, then Latin American Caribbean literature, then US literature, and the interviews. And it, this is important because the realities of the US and Europe are very different from Latin America and the Caribbean. And Latin America and Caribbean has a very different reality from Puerto Rico. 
and the Puerto Rican literature can be very politically biased. So we have, I had to read everything with a grain of salt because one thing is the reality they paint and the other thing was the reality the interviewers, the interviewees gave me. So then with all that literature, I could start off saying like, okay, if I'm gonna talk about geographical indications uh, and to, to people in the island who have no idea what a geographical indication is because we know, we, we only know trademarks uh, and uh, if we use, if we have used similar concepts as geographical indications before, but it's really taken out of context. Um, I said to myself, like, at first I have to explain what this is and how it works and why should we use it as a, a tool, not like the magical one that's going to solve our, uh, all our problems, but a tool that's just there available for us to do something different to the agriculture of Puerto Rico. Um, and then talk about the um, issue spotting and have some recommendations. So basically, the defining geographical indications was very e easy in the sense of the literature that I found with the case studies, but it was harder for me to um, put a theory behind it. But basically what's a geographical indication is that, is that there's a gap between consumer and producer on basically information asymmetry and that label conveys that information to the consumer. The consumer says like, hey, that was actually a great experience. It builds reputation to the producer, but the producer's not alone. Um, it has a, a complete supply chain. And that's why Ostrom's collective theory is there. And if you wrap that all together and, and put it in a nice bow, there's supposed to be economic development, hence innovation. Um, and, and then talking about the case studies that I found on best, best practices and things to avoid, I wanted to see like, okay, if I'm gonna focus on Puerto Rico, I have to be as close as possible to the reality of Puerto Rico. So I first found the Café de Colombia, which is one of the best examples. Then following that was uh, how, uh, Hawaiian Kona Coffee, which yes, they're a state of the US, but it has almost identical social uh, social economic circumstances to Puerto Rico. Um, and then the not so good examples, more, mostly things to avoid was uh, Jamaica Blue Mountain Coffee and Tequila de Mexico. And, uh, and then I came up with the five factors. Something that I noticed along my literature review was a method and a finding for issue spotting and recommendations. So they kept and the literature kept talking about like a product description, a qualification standard, geographical area, uh, collective organization, marketing, the government, a third party certification body, and economic impact. And it basically um, stated that uh, geographical indication policies can have of, over uh, the like from 10 to 50 criteria. And I said like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I have to make this simple to myself and for everyone else to, to understand this. So I compiled those criteria into the five factors, which is basically pro specifications, collective organization, marketing, legal institutional and economic impact. And with that, I could start the issue spotting. So the Marca del País is a certification composite mark created in 2002 and it's owned by the Department of Agriculture. It's for raw and value-added products basically because unfortunately we have a colonial mindset and we view our local products as inferior. Hence 
90% of the products that we consume are imported. Thus, <laughs> we have a really bad food insecurity and things like Hurricane Maria happen. Um, and there's certain farmers that qualify and there's various problems here. First, it covers the whole island and it covers multiple products. And the farmer qualifications are very vague. But when you put it on a benchmark, I would say it's like right smack in the middle because one of the good things that I had to my advantage was that there's other certification marks that are more or less the same that exist in Puerto Rico, like the, the, the little wheel that you see in the corner that says uh, made in Puerto Rico. Um, and when I compared them against my case studies, I was like, no, Del País is right smack in the middle, whereas made in Puerto Rico is like, um, thank you, but for your efforts, but that's going to be like a D minus. <laughs> um, more specifically on issue spawning and the, um, setting up some recommendations was that um, the uh, law as it is negatively affects agricultural small and medium businesses because the qualification standards are over here and the reality of the farmers are over here. So that means that there's a gap between what they really need and to reach this point, and then they don't receive any assistance to reach this point. And there's even more of a gap when you consider that the majority of the uh, incentives for um, the agri for agriculture in Puerto Rico are either production or volume based, which makes no sense whatsoever. But the thing is that um, these uh, the few farmers that do qualify can't even use the resources that are available um, in the Department of Agriculture. So it, so it was like okay. First, I have to narrow this uh, trademark down into um, converting it to a geographical indication and then um, create a workaround to, be, to bridge the, these gaps. So that's why I say that there is uh, industrialization by invita invitation because that affects agriculture. Um, the, the fact that the Department of Agriculture doesn't really care about agriculture is another impediment. The over-reliance on imports, the disorganized support that you really don't know what's the, if, if you qualify, what papers to file, um, the information that you need. Um, different employees might give you different types of requirements to fulfill. It's a fishing expedition guessing game, but on steroids, basically. But with but I found some solutions. So basically, the the first one was to um, create an incentive for for farmers so they can like have a, a financial and technical resource to build a code of practice. And this code of practice was going to be focused on. Uh, um, the five factors. So basically, it was going to be that the farmers were going to have a meeting. Let's say that all these farmers are um, coffee producers, and they would put on paper what they do for each of the five factors. And it doesn't necessarily have to lead to a geographical indication. The more important part here was to have it documented and for everyone to know what they are supposed to be doing um, to have a grading system and to start collecting data. And then we can talk about clearly delineated duties so they can know how to uh, tackle these types of uh, geographical indications or trademarks, having business type incentives. So instead of a production or volume base being like, okay, for small businesses, it's these requirements. 
for medium are these requirements and for large are these requirements. Um, and, and having a grading system. So it's, it, it, the grading system is very similar to, um, you know, in, in high school, the A, B, C, D, F system. That was basically it. Um, and uh, um, some of the things that I encountered with the results was that I built Del País in a way that it was going to be a uh, a guide or a backbone for people to say like, hey, this is actually something that we can do, that we can start working on, and we can register it as a trademark. And and uh, if it go if everything goes well, then we can talk about geographical indications because with Del País, some of the products were definitely geographical indications. And some others you were like, mm, maybe. Um, and and then others were like, no, <laughs> that has no chance in any way whatsoever. So for instance, with uh, coffee, and the first impression you might have is that, yeah, definitely coffee, coffee has been in Puerto Rico since, it's, since before the uh, we were a Spanish colony, we have a history, has a reputation. People associate it, associate the product to Puerto Rico. Why should it be? Well, the thing is that it's dominated by um, foreign industries that have a chokehold on the garment, and the people who are trying to preserve the 100 percent pure Puerto Rican coffee have no say in the matter. So there's like a, a contrast there. But then there's other things like um, and that uh, there's a group of uh, farmers that are trying to revive vanilla. Um, vanilla is a really useful counter cyclical product because, and that you don't need any land because it's an orchid. So it's both pretty and functional. And that sort of thing is it is very positive to see because it's something that you can say, yeah, if you work to um to have like for instance a co-branding or more financial resources and technical skills, eventually like let's say five years from now we can talk about geographical indications. Another example um was more of the definite you should you should be a geographical indication like yesterday is the roasted pork. So we have a tradition in Puerto Rico where we season and roast our pork in a very particular way. And um, it's uh, quite delicious and it has um, cuerito or crispy pork skin. And we even use the seasoning for turkeys and it's called pavo chon. So it's, that's like pavo, which is turkey in Spanish. and Chong is the lechon part or the pork part of the word. Um, and it creates like this really flavorful turkey. Um, and the association behind the pork um, uh, pork meat producers is doing an awesome job. And uh, what's stopping them from being a full-fledged geographic indication? The issues that I just pointed out. And that takes me to my future works. So, so who can hold me home or force hammer is basically me going through all of those products and saying like, okay, now that we covered Del País and this uh, like umbrella type of uh, geographical indication, now we can go into the realities of uh, each product, coffee, pork, um, rum, vanilla, even wine, and say, are you worthy to be a geographical indication? Another future work is the possible coexistence of trademarks and geographical indications. So think that's a, a kind of a, a little bit weird is that trademarks and geographical indications are brothers that hate each other. 
and it, that, that's the norm. But then you have things like um, certification marks where or collective marks like um, or geographic communications like campaign where yes, there's the collective organization, but then each individual champagne business has their own trademark or for instance the famous gluten-free organic vegan uh, marks and then there's uh, um, your individual business uh, trademark um, but we've never seen or or for instance the famous case of Bud Bar and Budweiser but we never seen a thing like it's to one logo and it's both. Um, and then the kind of obvious elephant in the room is that I had to write the dissertation in English and my audience is uh, Spanish speaking. So I have to translate my dissertation. Um, and in the very near future, I plan to have my own business to kind of demystify intellectual property and basically focus on having consulting services to the agri to the agricultural industry of Puerto Rico. And that's my contact info if you ever want to reach me. And thank you. Oh, Paula, if you ever want to expand that business across the Caribbean, I suspect you have many potential clients because I think everything you spoke about has resonated with all of us who are in the Caribbean um, in the participants list. And the ability to use GI as a source of economic development for the region is something that I think it's fantastic that you are researching because it's research that is needed. Um, I know there's also research going on at um, Mona UE, and I know we are in talks about GI projects. So I'm so glad to have met you, and I'm so glad you were able to share the experience of how it was actually to conduct this project. Um, the point of this series really is to see how do people conduct the research as well as hearing about the research, because often we'll hear about the research, but we don't actually know how it's done. So I really appreciate you mm -hmm. sharing. And I'm going to open the floor to uh, questions. So anyone who has a question, please feel free to put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, Eden, you can kick us off with the questions. Yes, good good afternoon. And again, interesting presentation. And I'm happy that you brought in the issue of industrialization by invitation linked to Operation Bootstrap. Because even in Trinidad and Tobago, we had used that model of development as well but in the early days of independence. But my specific question to you, recognizing that I also teach here uh, international trade law, um, how do you factor geographical indications in the context of the TRIPS agreement? Uh, would, well, would, yes? Um, I factored it in, um, in the sense that with, with the US, um, we have the advantage that um, we can have uh, um, some sort of uh, reciprocity in, in the U.S. and any other country that has signed trips, but it's a, it's a little bit limited. Um, limited in the sense that, like sometimes, it's uh, um, it can only be recognized in the island or in the U.S. and or or only in that in in that hemisphere of uh, trade of trademark law. Um, that's like the only limitation with uh, Puerto Rico and trips. Hey, Alex, I see your hand is up. Um, yes, so during your presentation, which was sensational, by the way, um, you spoke about having to simplify what you were saying so that others could understand it. Um, I was wondering if you could provide some insight on how you would go about um, necessary, uh, um, explaining your research, for example, to the layman or someone who's less acquainted with intellectual property specifically. Um, so I always recommend um, using uh, either uh, metaphors or um, like a 
a more of a real example. So let's say that you're in the intellectual property clinic and have someone that sells oranges. You would use that orange for the example. So then it's relatable for them. And also like uh, something that really helped me a lot was actually the um, intellectual property uh, clinic at the law school because I interacted with a lot of uh, uh, farmers and small and medium businesses. So that like trying to remove the legalese uh, by explaining to clients was really helpful. Um, and also um, a lot of talking to myself of like remove, uh, turning off the lawyer in me and saying, and reading it out loud and saying like, do I understand this sentence? And going sentence by sentence saying, do, uh, do I understand it? Do, uh, uh, is the message being conveyed in a way that um, other people can understand it. And like that, that's my biggest pet peeve with, um, <laughs> with legal literature overall, that sometimes offers right for themselves. And, and when you, when someone else reads it, you're like, what are you trying to say? Um, so that's like the main goal of just trying to remove yourself from the equation and try to Im imagine yourself or Im imagine that you're um, talking to um, a client or let's say you can also practice with uh, um, your non-lawyer friends. That's also really helpful. I think that was really useful advice, Paula, especially because in the type of research you're doing, you need to be able to communicate with people to have an impact, because if it's just done in a very um, academic manner, you're not going to have the impact that you're hoping to have. And I think that's important for all of us in terms of our research. We do research and we want to publish it and all that, which is great and part of our jobs, of course. Um, but we really wanted to translate on the ground. And I think that's very helpful information you provide to Alex there. We have time for one final question. I actually have a question, but if anybody else has one, do raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, so you mentioned that the the um, Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee was a, a not a good example to not follow that. Coincidentally, in my uh, managing IP assets class this week, we were briefly talking about that. And I wondered if you could just um, expand a little bit on why it's not a good example to follow. Oh, yes. It's because it's way too strict. And none of the coffee growers can comply with the requirements. So their only option is to break the law in order to comply with the law. And so like, for instance, they, they have a really, yeah, they have a really weird requirement where they, um, they tell you uh, the size of the box because they don't package in bags. They package in like wooden boxes and they tell you the dimensions of the box and the quantity of boxes and how much uh, kilograms each box should have. And each, uh, quan each specific quantity of that is impossible to, to comply. Okay, so I think we're learning that uh, in looking at the research, things might be in existence and there is a need to question some of these things. Is this actually practical? Can we have people who are meant to be benefiting from this actually benefiting? Mm -hmm. um, so Paula, I must say, yeah. I really enjoyed this. I mean, I enjoyed it when you talked about your actual thesis at WIPIP. I enjoyed hearing about how you went about the research today. So I must say thank you very much. Um, this is bringing us to the end thank of our you. session today. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you also, Suzy. And we have our next research seminar taking place on Friday, 21st October. In that one, we're going to have Sina Menz, who's co-founder of Clausebase, which is a contract dra drafting uh, software. And he's going to be talking about AI in contract drafting. And we have Metka Potnik, and she's going to be talking about the F-List. The F-List being a um, resource in the UK that tries to promote and feature female artists that came about as a result of research that revealed that female artists are really underrepresented 
in the UK music industry and are under earning compared to their male counterparts. So she's going to be talking about how her research is being used to create a practical change in the UK music industry. So I hope to see many of you in the future seminars. And I must again thank you very much to Paula and Zui for sharing their ex expertise and information with us today.